I want to welcome everybody and uh, I'm pleased that we're here to host uh, Commissioner Laura Fortman for this conversation uh, with my colleagues. Um, this is Laura's second stint as uh, Commissioner of Labor. Um, she served for Governor Baldacci uh, several years ago and in between uh, she was in Washington in the wage and hour division at US Department of Labor. And uh, before that, she was a giant advocate at the State House of, uh, for women's right, equality, and pay equity. And I think the pay equity part has always been a big part of, uh, of Laura's career. And, uh, and the way we're going to do this, we have an agenda with my colleagues talking, but I'm just going to ask Laura, Commissioner Fortman, a couple of questions um, and uh, kind of broad questions so everybody can get a flavor of her. And, um, and her focus. And I just have to say, having known the commissioner for several years, um, people come first all the time. Workers come first, businesses come first, communities come first, and uh, her employees come first too. I mean, she's a big advocate, um, especially during this transition in uh, explaining the hard work that the department does. So with that, Laura, um, the transition during the pandemic, can you just talk about how the Department of Labor has handled that? Well, I think, I mean, before we jump into that, um, Lee, as you were talking about the, the importance of workers and advocacy and equality, I think it's important to recognize that today is Juneteenth. Um, and that's a significant day. And especially when we think about everything that's going on, um, not just the pandemic, um, but the uh, challenges in the economy as well as putting racial equality uh, front and center. So I, I'm just, mm. I'm thrilled to be here with you um, today. I'm always thrilled um, to have an opportunity to talk with you, but I think today it's uh, especially important. So um, getting uh, back to what happened, you know, how has the department transitioned during the pandemic? I mean, um, I think first of all, it happened suddenly. Uh, you know, one day we were all talking about uh, employers um, demanding uh, creative solutions for getting employees uh, in the workplace. We were doing a lot of outreach uh, with uh, people who were formerly incarcerated, people with substance abuse issues, uh, just being very inclusive, trying to pull everybody into the workforce. And then the next day, it was businesses needing to close in order to protect people's health. Um, and so the focus here at the Department of Labor shifted from uh, pretty much our employment services side of the house to the unemployment services side of the house. And we um, uh, had to figure out how to do work differently, uh, how to set up systems that could be accessed remotely, um, how to keep our employees safe as we continue to provide services. So I think it's been an opportunity for all of us to learn and uh, to rethink how we're doing our work, but to stay committed to the mission. Um, but Great, and a couple of specific programs from the department, the work share program um, seems to be a really great uh, way to help people. And you've got safety works um, and when, as people go back to the workplace, they need a safe environment. Could you just talk about those two a little sure. bit? So WorkShare is a program where an employer um, reaches out to the department, develops a plan, uh, and it's for temporary layoffs. So it's you can reduce your workforce for anywhere between 50% um, percent to 10%. Percent. Uh, and the employee gets that, let's say it's 50%, they get 50% of their wages from the employer. And then they're able to make up 50% um, in partial unemployment benefits. Uh, so whatever their weekly benefit amount would be, you'd get 50% of that. Additionally, Congress took some action and created a program called the Federal Pandemic Unemployment Compensation Program, and that's $600 a week. Um, and for those who are on WorkShare, they are also eligible for that $600. So it's, it's a good um, opportunity for the employers to keep talented uh, folks connected to them at work and keep their businesses going, and for the employees to be able to um, make up what they would have lost in their wages. Um, and then Safety Works, as you know, uh, is a consultation program that helps employers um, provides advice and training to employers 
uh, to um, improve workplace safety. Um, we are responsible for enforcement, but only in the public sector. Um, but in these times, what we're doing is uh, doing, providing lots of information to employers as they're trying to help um, make sure that they're in compliance with CDC and OSHA regulations. Great, thank you. And I think one of the great components of this transition and how the administration has handled it has been interagency cooperation, DHS, DECD, and DOL. And I think an untold story is that a big part of what you've had to do as commissioner and DHS in particular is to rebuild the departments with programs and peoples. And uh, um, so can you just talk about how you're working together with your colleagues? Well, we actually have uh, daily um, cabinet meetings um, where we all put uh, out whatever the challenges that we're facing and then figure out how we can have a holistic response so that it's not DOL coming up with a solution on its own uh, that's uh, not in alignment with what, for example, DECD is doing. Um, so it's a chance for all of us to work together and to really keep the people in the businesses of the state of Maine at the center of our decision making. Um, one of the uh, um, agencies that we're working with a lot right now, which might seem odd, is the Department of Corrections. Um, one of the challenges that we've had has been um, imposter fraud of people applying for unemployment insurance uh, where there's been a data breach somewhere else, not at the department. Um, and people are using that stolen data to apply for unemployment insurance. We do know that there are main people who have been, um, had their unemployment uh, stopped because they've been caught up in this. And so the Department of Corrections folks who are familiar with uh, doing identification verification have helped us out and we will by the end of today have cleared up all of those cases. That's great. That's great. And just a couple of more points on unemployment insurance. Um, it's a national problem. Every state is facing this. The numbers are extraordinary. I think uh, you've explained it really well to the legislative committee and you're doing the weekly uh, briefings to people, but it's still an awful lot of people. Anything to say to add to the work you guys are doing? No, just that um, it is a national problem. Uh, there is, um, you know, there are some root causes of that. It's, you know, chronic underfunding, unemployment insurance. There are two pots. One is the benefit side of the house and that's paid for with employer taxes. And then the other part is administration, the running of the program. And that funding has been 100% federally funded. And that pot of money has shrunk dramatically. Um, we're receiving about $10 million less a year, or we were, uh, to run the program than we were about 10 years ago. Um, so even though costs have gone up, and, you know, there's been a little bit of inflation, the actual dollars have gone down dramatically. And so going into this pandemic, there was no state that was uh, in a position where they had the adequate staffing um, in order to respond. So um, we are all working together across the country as well to share information, ideas, strategies, uh, and to advocate for strengthening the program because it's critical. Right now, we have put out $807 million back into the economy through unemployment insurance. And that's one of the um, foundational principles behind unemployment is as an economic stabilizer. And in spite of the challenges, it is still meeting that need to help stabilize the economy and communities and to um, get benefits uh, into the hands of, um, of main people. Well, thank you, Commissioner. And it is unprecedented, the numbers of people. Um, but I think the steps you have outlined to the Legislative Committee and to the your weekly things are sound and good. And um, I just, uh, I know people are frustrated because they're in tough times and we're in an uncertain time. But I think the steps you've taken and the way you communicate shows empathy um, and it comes across. So I just want to thank you with that. Thank you. Well, the staff here is amazing. And Lee, I think that's uh, that they're really the kind of the unsung heroes of this. Uh, you know, staff has been working six days a week uh, since March, um, and they keep showing up uh, in spite of concerns about their own health. Um, and they're doing their job because they believe in, in the mission of the agency and in making sure that Maine people are served. Great. Well, well thank you, Commissioner. 
So um, for those of you who haven't seen the uh, agenda, we're gonna have some of my colleagues from EMDC's workforce uh, division give briefings to the commissioner who's gonna ask questions and ask for clarifications and, or reinforcements. And uh, um, I may be calling on some of the people I can see who have joined us to uh, um, kind of add on to some of uh, my colleagues' comments. And at the end, if we have time, we'll accept some um, uh, questions which um, since I control the mute buttons, I'll decide who gets questions. So we'll try to, if we have enough time, we'll have as many questions as we can. So with that, Kim Donovan, our Senior Workforce Development Specialist um, is gonna lead us off. And um, she has been the lead person on the virtual workshop services. And it's really been a, for us, the key component in our transition to maintain the services to the clients. And so Kim, um, thank you, and um, thank you, Commissioner Portman, for um, providing that information. It's really, um, we work very closely with the staff at uh, the Bangor Tri-County Career Center, and I know that they have shifted over to um, working in unemployment, and um, it's really, I just, it's, I mean, I know that they're, they're saying to us, all the time. Um, we wish we could do more. We wish we could do more. So I know that our staff is doing what we can to assist them um, to work with our uh, customers who are co-enrolled in the CSSP program. So um, I just want to start out by saying that um, Eastern Maine Development Corporation Workforce Development, um, just as Commissioner Fortman said, one day we're doing our work um, in person and we're working along, we're working with our customers, we're working with businesses, and then overnight we have to switch to something else. And fortunately, we had a foundation of uh, working in the Career Center um, with our partners there at BES with um, doing a workshop called Job Readiness. And fairly quickly, we were able to shift that to um, doing an online workshop um, under the same title, uh, Job Readiness. And in this workshop, we work with um, our customers and it, all of our workshops are open to the public. And uh, we want these workshops to be able to assist our participants and members of the public who join to be able to improve their skills around job search, uh, developing their resume, um, getting together a good cover letter, and being able to improve their skills around interviewing. We also bring in employers who are able to provide information about how to navigate their business's um, career portable, portal, um, and how to uh, really make their resume stand out. So when we were working um, in person at the Career Center and we would um, invite folks to come in, we would tell our participants that they would graduate from our um, workshops when they got employment. And since we have moved online, we have had two of our um, participants graduate into employment and then we've had other participants who've been able to really increase their confidence around being able to um, feel better about interviewing. We've had folks really um, strengthen their resumes, their elevator pitch, and really feel more prepared in their job search. Um, we've added other um, online workshops as um, we have gone along. And it seemed like week by week as we um, began our work um, virtually, we were able to add other workshops. Um, and in response to, um, we had a cohort of customers who were um, in the classroom taking healthcare sector uh, training. And uh, we decided that we wanted to allow them to continue to come together because we knew that they were a strong support system for each other. And we wanted to give them an opportunity to continue to provide that support to each other, but continue to provide them with um, content that was relevant to um, healthcare training. So we've done that through the quarantine healthcare connections. And this workshop has brought together a very impressive list of guest speakers from healthcare employers to um, educators, um, both adult ed educators and folks from um, the community college system. And we even had a former participant who um, obtained a CNA license through working with uh, the WIOA program. And she's now working as a traveling CNA. And uh, she 
she got her credential and she is on the road working currently at a, a long-term care facility in a COVID hotspot. So we were able to bring her in virtually to a virtual workshop. And she was very inspiring with the information that she brought to our participants. And um, because of that information that she brought to us, um, we now have uh, one of our participants who is looking towards being a traveling CNA um, when she obtains her license. And that was, she didn't even know that that was a career option before mm -hmm. she um, attended that workshop. Um, we have other workshops as well. We partner with um, another community organization, New Ventures Maine, to bring information to our participants about uh, career exploration. So that's a great opportunity for um, individuals who are looking to maybe get into uh, new or different employment, um, or they're they're not really sure where to start. So that's a that's a great place to really be able to begin to figure out um, where do where do their skills fit within um, the world of work. Um, and then we also have probably first and foremost, sort of the gateway to um, all of our workshops and our programs is our informational workshop. And that's where um, any service provider or a new customer could come to really learn about our program, learn about our service and learn about, our, about eligibility. Um, and we really welcome, again, any service providers or any individuals who um, might be wondering if they're eligible, um, if this is a program that would fit for them um, to attend that workshop so that they can learn more about our services. Great, thank you, Kim. <laughs> Wonderful stuff. Um, Lisa Larson, president of the community college is online. Um, Lisa, would you talk about the online survey, servicing you folks have been doing? <clears throat> um, I can certainly introduce it and then, whoops. Am I, am I, I'm not, okay, sorry, <laughs> it's Friday. <laughs> um, I can introduce it and then I would ask Chris Winstead to talk more in depth about it. He's been closer to that. But once we uh, realized that the pandemic was here and was uh, going to be in place and with us for a while, we realized that as a system, the seven colleges could certainly start to put together some education and training that would support not only our health care arena and sector, but other sectors as well. And it was amazing how quickly those colleges identified what the gaps were, what the training uh, that could be put out uh, and ultimately was. And I would ask Chris to um, share what some of those trainings are and any recent data that he has on those. Great, and I could just like to make the point that the community college really stepped in at, a, at an important time where people were feeling uneasy about the continuation of their training. So I wanna compliment uh, Lisa, your, your college and the whole system for that. Thank you. So Chris, are you there? You right. can keep it kind of brief, we've got a time schedule, but uh, yep. can you give us some more details? I can. So each of the campuses stood up um, a level of training in multiple fields. For Eastern Maine Community College, we launched a medical records information tech program, an MHRTC cool. certification, as well as a substance abuse uh, counselor certification. In addition, we ran with two cohorts of CNA, and then we are standing up an EMT and advanced EMT. Um, across the across the system, there are other courses covering you know topics such as phlebotomy all the way through to um, uh, yep lost my train of thought I apologize all the way through uh, to uh, coding specialists and it was a real chance for folks to be able to receive free training at home. The goal was to provide them with a certificate of worth leading towards employment opportunities as well as a pathway back for education. Um, We've had a great turnout with all of our trainings across the system, uh, far more interest than I think we had spots available. And we tried to get folks into other programs. So if they came in for like a phlebotomy and it was full, we would recommend one of the other training, training opportunities. So we've had a, a high level of success with it. Great, thank you so much, Chris. That's good stuff. And thank you, Lisa. Commissioner, any questions uh, for Kim? Or yeah, I mean, I, Kim, as you were talking about this, I mean, one of the challenges that we experienced 
is that many of the folks we serve are not comfortable um, uh, with uh, computers and don't necessarily have the technology. So I was just curious, did you uh, experience that in your programs or and what were you able to do to increase the comfort level um, for folks that you were working with if that was in fact a challenge? Well, I think that um, with some folks it certainly is a challenge. And um, fortunately, we were able to have um, individual staff maybe coach folks so that they could increase their comfort level. And um, we invite folks to join. Some folks maybe just join by phone if they're not comfortable with sharing themselves on video. And we have found that for those folks who maybe initially just joined by phone, eventually they are joining on video and they are um, participating more. And then um, in terms of our other services, if they don't even have a computer, we're able to um, offer our other services such as um, individual career advising, um, just strictly through the phone. That's great, thank you. Great, thank you, Kim. And uh, next we're gonna hear about the Youth Workforce Academy with Leah Gulliver, who uh, did a promotional launch on the waterfront that went viral. Thank you, Lee. Uh, he keeps saying it went viral. That's debatable. Um, so we we put together the Young Mainers Workforce Academy uh, based on the needs that we were hearing from employers and around the community that it was very important for us, even critical for us, to be engaging young people and making sure that they understand that there are jobs that they can do right here in Maine. So that was our focus. And hearing from employers, we learned from them over a, a long period that we we kept hearing the same thing, that they really need to have their soft skills. They really need to be able to understand how to be organized to show up for work, how to become a dependable employee, a reliable employee, and that they may need to understand how to budget and, and how to go forward. So that was the basis, and that's been put together through an online training. We did have to pivot again. We were planning to launch our first pilot in person in March, and so we turned around and decided to shorten that and change it up and offer that as a virtual program. So that actually kicked off this week. Um, yesterday, Thursday was our first day. Um, and so it's it's two days a week and we've created the program to be three hours a day. So it is kind of intense to have a three hour day, but we are including a lot of activity, a lot of interaction, a lot of dialogue. And again, to speak to that point that Laura made, a lot of people have this um, comfort level around classroom learning and in person learning. And then when it comes to online learning, it's very different and, and can be very intimidating. We focus a lot of our training, especially with young people through dialogue. And we find that that is much more approachable and really lowers that barrier and still yields some fantastic results. We're able to still work on activities and still go through processes and exercises like they would in a classroom, but we're offering them that dialogue and that group cohort. And we find a lot of success in cohort groups. We're having a lot of success in the participation already and I'm really thrilled with that so far. Right now we have 16 individuals who were able to be enrolled in our program and are in the Young uh, Mainers Workforce Academy. That sounds oh, great. Oh, I'm sorry, Lee. No, go ahead, Laura. Please. No, I was going to say two things. One, I see your Frances Perkins picture um, behind you. Um, so she's a, a hero of mine. Um, uh, but I won't, I won't go down the Francis Perkins um, conversation right now. Uh, you said you had 16 uh, people participating in the program. What is the age range of those uh, young people and what is the duration of the program? The duration of the program will be seven weeks plus one additional session as a graduation. Um, and the age ranges are from ages 16 to 24. Yep. And is this, uh, is there a stipend involved with these students or how, how does that work, Leah? Yes, so by combining this experience with um, short-term temporary work experiences with host sites, we are able to pay them for their classroom time. So they're coming to work and they're working from home in the classroom and we're teaching them about that presentation as well, which was kind of a cool twist that we didn't really expect to need to do. So we're, we're learning about that and uh, how to manage that at home as well. Yeah, that's great. 
and uh, since it just started yesterday, you, you don't um, have any outcomes yet, but uh, what is it that you're hoping for at the end of this seven weeks? So our program reaches beyond the academy. Um, folks will get the, the full range of our, of our program and services. What we're hoping for is that they will feel more confident in their pathway. So whether they decide to go straight to work or whether they decide to go through training, whether they decide to go through something specific like a trade school or even some apprenticeships, we're really looking at that as helping them to feel really confident with whichever outcome they want to move forward with. That sounds great. And you said you're working with a number of employers. Are there certain sectors or a particular sector that you're working in? Well, the sectors for employers for partnerships has kind of shifted since COVID. So mm -hmm. we're still looking for more employers to work with to um, collaborate on the work experiences. When we started, we were looking at healthcare, um, IT, and skilled labor specifically. Those are still on our mind. Those are still on our radar. Um, we know that we're going to be looking at a lot of retirements and um, especially skilled labor areas. So we're really focused in those areas, understanding the high wage and high demand. Um, but that's really overarching. That's in the back of our mind is high wage, high demand. So we're really looking for any opportunities there. Okay, that's great. And um, I don't know if you've been connected at all with the uh, children's cabinet or um, have paid attention to that. Lee had asked earlier about how does the um, how do the departments work together to um, achieve the, the goals and vision of the governor. And the Children's Cabinet is one of those kind of key groups that meets. And it sounds like the work that you're doing is in complete alignment with uh, the goals for young people in Maine. So I was just curious if you've had any interaction. Specifically, I have not had interaction with that particular group. Um, we are collaborating with the board that oversees us um, in a young Mainers uh, group there. So we do stay in touch there. And that involves a lot of people around the community. Um, and we are always closely connected with our partners at Department of Labor um, and BES services. Mm -hmm. That's great. And Laura, that's a great point. And we'll reach out to the Children's Cabinet and put uh, Leah on their agenda at your advice. <laughs> Yeah, Anna Hicks is the staff person, Lee. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. That's great. That's a perfect uh, form and format. Um, so our next uh, speaker, we have a uh, uh, National Farm Worker Jobs Program. It's pretty significant. And, uh, and Chris Ha is our guy. And so Chris, uh, can you give us a briefing on uh, the work you do and, and going forward, what your expectations are? Surely, uh, thanks. and. Uh, Good to see you, Commissioner. Um, my name is Chris Ha. I'm a program manager at Eastern Maine Development Corporation. I oversee the uh, National Farm Worker Jobs Program grant. And uh, that funding is directly through the US Department of Labor and is awarded to the state. And uh, in many respects, though, it's really um, identical to the WIOA adult program. It serves a low income population and the goal is to uh, provide different services to address barriers and then um, with the expected outcome of uh, employment with more stable earnings and um, in in-demand occupations. And so, yes, in a nutshell, the NFJP is another opportunity to pull people into Maine's workforce. Um, another important point is the uh, grant is statewide. And so it uh, serves a uh, throughout the state of Maine, regardless of uh, county boundaries. And uh, individuals who are served through the program uh, have to have been employed in agricultural work within the last two years. And that can be uh, quite a wide range of industries that, that we have here in Maine. Uh, as you know, the blueberry industries down east, um, mid coast, uh, dairy, uh, Christmas tree production, maple syrup production, uh, potatoes and broccoli up north and uh, increasingly aquaculture. Um, then there are many other uh, types of activities as well. And so we encourage people to really work with our intake staff to describe the work histories uh, because uh, they could be eligible for this program. Um, dependent family members of individuals who are in this kind of work could also 
be eligible. And that certainly expands uh, the number of people who could be served. And so a spouse or uh, older child of, uh, in a household of, that depends on this type of agricultural work uh, could be eligible um, for the NFJP. And um, in general, this is a very vulnerable population by nature due to working in agriculture and residing in rural areas. Uh, this is a population that's very geographically isolated. Um, and so that's very significant as far as access to opportunities. Um, it's also, it can be a very diverse uh, population as well because farm labor involves uh, many uh, workers who uh, come from many different backgrounds or parts of the country or um, and so language, uh, English language learners uh, could be a significant part of this um, uh, population served through this program as well. And so again, it's an opportunity to really um, pull uh, these types of workers uh, into our workforce. And um, currently, yeah, uh, there are definitely some challenging times as we all know, a lot of uncertainty due to the pandemic and uh, the economy. However, uh, I really just want to emphasize that this is uh, an exciting time. Uh, we're in the process of renewing for the coming year. And so we're planning uh, to deliver services. And the, uh, some examples are stabilizing the employment of migrant workers who come into the state by providing like primarily transportation and housing related services to them. Um, working also working alongside WIOA partners uh, statewide, as I mentioned, it's a statewide program. So we're really excited um, at the developments that are occurring right now and the relationships, new relationships to offer trainings in new ways, cohort trainings or online uh, technology based. And so we are participating just alongside all of our colleagues at EMDC and statewide um, in that effort. And um, the, uh, I want to emphasize that within the agricultural community, I've heard anecdotally, but also just through constant outreach that uh, there's a skills gap uh, experienced in among farmers and agricultural employers, um, also a lack of workers and a need for upgrading skills. And this program really is uh, designed to be able to work with farmers as partners um, to be able to ensure that the workforce that they have is reliable and stable going forward. And so um, uh, in this new era that we're in, uh, as we kind of figure out how to do things differently, we have this new uh, exciting relationship with the Aroostook County Action Program uh, where we'll be uh, partnering with them uh, to deliver this program uh, up north in Aroostook County and which is really part of the heartland, the uh, agricultural heartland of our state. So it's very exciting, a lot of potential to serve uh, a lot of people and uh, co-enrollment as well. The uh, an important aspect of the NFJP program is that uh, by design, we are partnering with youth and adult programs uh, throughout the state to ensure that people are co-enrolled and uh, being able to receive uh, all the resources they need for multiple programs. And yeah, with that, I'm just, yeah, we're really excited, as I mentioned. Again, it's uh, uncharted waters, but um, look forward to working with you and hearing any feedback that you may hear from the department and statewide in your outreach. And I just kind of want to keep this uh, uh, two-way uh, communication uh, with our program. So feel free to ask any questions now or to follow up. Great. Well, thank you, Chris. Um, I have a couple of questions. I'm curious about the, the working relationship between your program and the state monitor advocate who is housed at the Department of Labor and whether or not there's regular contact or infrequent contact or, or how that works or, or if there's any relationship there. Yes, uh, we have uh, an agreement in place. So it's um, a practice of ours to work uh, very closely with the monitor advocate. And then um, in actuality, at a minimum, it would be, uh, we meet formally uh, 
bi-monthly with a farm worker, a statewide farm worker group that we call the Farm Worker Resource Network. It includes the uh, Maine Mobile Health Program and others. And so uh, that really is built into having um, you know, a regular uh, conversation. However, it's really just uh, ongoing. I receive uh, emails from Jorge uh, or yeah, just on a regular basis as we try to either share referrals or um, I, yeah, just uh, address different issues that uh, solve problems and things like that. And so, um, yeah, as recently as this week, it's really an ongoing, um, and he uh, alerts me to opportunities that uh, I knew, want to know about. And so, yeah, very close relationship. That's good. I mean, it's good to hear that. And especially, I know that during the pandemic, there have been a lot of concerns about agricultural workers, migrant and seasonal farm workers. Um, you know, there were um, materials that have been translated into multiple, well, I think it's only in Spanish, actually. We have other materials that have been translated in, around unemployment insurance in eight different languages. But, um, and I know that there have been concerns about uh, health and safety conditions. So I just want to make sure that there is that kind of open communication between uh, your program and um, and the department. And knowing Jorge as I do, I, I was I was assuming that there was a good relationship, but I just wanted to make sure um, because uh, I, I think it's uh, mutually beneficial to have to have that kind of a solid relationship. And how many people? Um, is the program covering, or do you anticipate that it'll cover this year, Chris? You said right. You well, uh, our plan is to serve up to 150 individuals, some of whom may be um, 40 who would be uh, short-term uh, services to migrant workers who come into the state. And so we're really, at this point, we're in a period of uh, rebuilding the program, um, having to create new uh, models for service delivery. Our past model had just, it was in need of revision. And so um, going forward, we're creating um, new relationships. Like I mentioned, the Aristotle County Action Program with all of their knowledge of like local employers and agricultural um, uh, entities and uh, partners. That's really going to be key. And then we would like to just yeah, use that uh, as a model going forward in different regions of the state. We've already experienced ex uh, success in Down East recently with our activities in Washington County. And so our success stories involve um, ind individuals who've completed community college or uh, and uh, in other parts of the state as well. Employer-based training is a big emphasis for us. We recently have been able to practice on the job training and work experience activities with participants. So to answer your question, yeah, at this point, we're really kind of uh, having to proactively build the uh, caseload to reach what it has been uh, historically. It hasn't really changed. Um, it's really been at that uh, scale, but. Yeah. Well, thank you, thank you, Chris. Another, oh, okay. No, one more question, Commissioner. No, I was just curious, Chris, you had mentioned the skills gap that the employers were seeing. I, I, I didn't know if you could just identify a couple of the skills that agricultural workers were saying, agricultural employers were saying they really needed. Right. Well, uh, just off the top of my head, I hear that, you know, um, uh, technology, I mean, that's probably the theme that we really hear across the board, but uh, agricultural operations really are just becoming more uh, kind of consolidated, more uh, sophisticated. The blueberry industry, it's, you know, fascinating to see through the even processing and freezing stages. It's, you know, very dependent on and sophisticated with technology. So that just requires a workforce that's able to uh, keep up. And I mentioned aqua aquaculture as well. Um, just what I've learned through what that looks like uh, as far as it's presented from some of these employers. That's very... Um, involved in terms of technology and uh, skills on the job as well. So we're trying to adapt to the needs and be really receptive to what we're hearing from employers throughout the state. Great, well, thank you. Thank you, Chris. 
And okay. uh, our, my next colleague is Susan Serini. She's the Director of Workforce Services, and she's going to talk about the employer response team, which is a very significant effort on our part. Um, EMDC does lending and business development, and having workforce part of that whole realm is really important. And Susan uh, values partnerships and uh, collaboration. So she's a, been a great person leading that. So Susan. Thanks Lee, and thank you to Commissioner Fortman and to Kim Moore who are both here today. Kim's the director of the Bureau of Employment Services and our partnerships there are really important to us. And I think you being here today, both of you um, shows your support um, for the workforce programs and we appreciate that. So thank you for being here today too. Um, our employer response team, before I get into that, I actually wanted to go back to the work short share piece really quick, um, just to give you a real live review that we actually received from someone who was unable to be here today. Um, Deb Newman, who is the CEO and president of the Bangor Chamber of Commerce, um, is a part of that work share. Um, she does a lot with businesses and even said she would serve as um, an ear for any businesses that wants to hear the real experience. And she really wanted us to let you know, Commissioner, that they've been very happy with the work um, that the DOL has been doing with them. So I wanted to share that to start off with. Going back to the employer response action team, um, with EMDC, we're very fortunate because in our programs, the workforce serves not just participants or individuals in the community, but we also serve employers. And I think what's really important about that are those who have been through um, closures, you know, you know about rapid response, you know, we're rapidly responding to things. This team actually is kind of the same model. Um, we're looking to be proactive a lot of the time. So new businesses coming into the community, we wanna be able to provide them with resources all at one table. We've been fortunate to have some success with that already. The other piece are existing businesses, having them know that there are resources available for them. And so through EMDC, through this response action team, we've been able to have new businesses that have come into the community and bring to the table our partners. Um, partnerships and relationships are what we continue to talk about. So this response team itself has um, it has EMDC, the main department of labor. It has your local community colleges. It has your local adult ed programs, job core, as well as economic development partners. They're all crucial to really what's available to businesses. So they provide trainings, they provide opportunities for workforce. Um, they provide everything possible. So our goal with this response team is to constantly be out there listening to what employers need, being able to respond to them by bringing those resources right to the table. Same for new businesses that want to come to the community, we recommend them reaching out because we have those resources. We're fortunate, you know, with the workforce side of it, it crosses over into all the work that we do. We have, like Lee mentioned, we have our lending team, we have our community initiatives team, we have our PTAC and DBE, DBE programs who all work with businesses. And the workforce component is very important and something that we are constantly hearing out there. So the workshops that we provided and the other information you've heard before and what you're still going to hear um, all cross over to that. So that employer response team is just like a rapid response team, but being proactive at the same time. We're very fortunate because Joanna Russell, who is the executive director of our region, she was very, she brought to a real life experience last, um, I think it was last spring, last summer in August, we actually got to work with a company in Piscataquis County. And they had went to her because they had some workforce needs. They had some turnover they, and some issues there, but we brought to the table, Joanna brought to the table along with EMDC, the community college, as well as um, economic development up in Piscataquis County. And we were able to work with that company, providing a survey, working with the workers. Um, and the response from the company was positive on how they really wanted to work with their workers. So we have some experience already with existing businesses, as well as a new business that had come into the Bangor region. We brought people to the table at that point to really show them what resources we have here, not just in this region, but in the state. So I think that that's a really important um, product to workforce itself. We have the skilled labor, we have the workers, um, and we want the businesses to know that we have them. So Susan, are you seeing certain themes? I mean, you've said workforce a number of times. Is it primarily business? Is that their concern? Have you seen any changes during the pandemic or what's happening on the ground, Susan? So on the ground, when it comes to businesses, I think a lot of our response to what we've created, especially with those virtual workshops or things that we're seeing or the things that we create are based on what we're hearing from businesses. 
So prior to what we're going through with the pandemic, there was the same things you would hear every day. You know, worker, we need workers that want to come to work or they're missing the soft skills or, but it's also under having the employers understand that there is a workforce out there. We want to hear from you to tell us what are you looking for? Or what is it that you're missing so that we can provide the type of training for them? That's kind of where the academy came out of, you know, what are your needs? Mm -hmm. um, the virtual workshops, they're always, you know, addressing um, what the employers need. We want to bring that right to the workforce itself. So if those that are looking for a job can hear what employers are looking for, it would help them start thinking about that as they're applying for these jobs. During this pandemic, I think a lot of what we're hearing are workers right now are, um, you know, there is some fear, of course, you know, going into the workplaces. But I think that the other things that we're hearing are, you know, there's not um, a lot of response in the sense of how can we apply for these jobs or what is it that would be attractive to the employer? And that's what we try to do. We really try to listen to the employer, be able to communicate that to the job seeker. So the job seeker has the tools and resources they need to provide for the employer themselves. So it's a two way street for us. And I think that that's the exciting part about our jobs is we get to work with both ends. And we really, like Chris mentioned and others have mentioned, we have on the job training, we have work experience options, and we have a lot of success where we've worked with employers who had a need. We provided you know, a work experience so they could see how that worker was. The worker got to relate to the job placement as well. And throughout that, as they became a strong employee, they got to see the employee rather than just a resume. Because sometimes you don't catch all those pieces just by looking at a resume and you can miss out on some good workers. So we really encourage businesses to talk with us, employers to reach out to us. Um, so we can share with them as well the things that we're seeing right on the front line. Um, and that's what we hope to do more of. That's great. Thank you. Well, I know we really appreciate the partnership with you. Um, and every time I have a chance to meet with you, I learn something new. So thank you. Well, you're very welcome. And thank you guys for your support. Thank you, Susan. Very good. Um, before I introduce the next uh, colleague to speak, I just want to acknowledge EMDC board members who have signed on, Dave Milan, Wayne Erkinson. Denise Bazelli and Lisa Larson. So uh, thank you for all you board members. And uh, like he is very competently quiet, uh, John Farley is here um, and available. I told him I might call on him at some point, but I uh, just want you commissioner to know that John Farley is right there. There he is. Hi, John. So, he's quiet. So uh, the last uh, um, thing on the agenda is the Connecting with Opportunities Initiative. And I just want to say, uh, early on in the governor's term, she created the Office of Opioid Abuse, because as attorney general, she could see what the problem was and what was significant as attorney general. She didn't look at it just as a law enforcement thing, but also as a rehab thing, which is unusual. And she, and she really brought that to the governor's office and, 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 and created that office. Um, we were pleased to have the Department of Labor invite EMDC to help with that process and we submitted a grant to the U.S. Department of Labor and over six million dollars came to Maine and uh, Doug Dunbar, our workforce development specialist, um, was the key person in writing that grant and reaching out to everybody and the focus is partnerships, collaborations, and all the different services. So um, Doug, last but least, Doug Dunbar. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Commissioner. And thank you all for, for being here. I was uh, just thinking as my coworkers were speaking of, of the tremendous outreach that EMDC, you know, has. And, uh, you know, we reach so many different segments of the community and do so much. I'm only with EMDC about a year so far, but I really uh, am so impressed with my, with my colleagues and the work that we do. Um, soon after I started at EMDC, I was asked to participate in the writing of this grant. Um, and it was one of the best experiences of my life because I was able to put some of my personal passion and experiences into that work. When I joined EMDC, I was, just about to graduate from the Penobscot County Adult Drug Treatment Court. After a 30 year career working in government, including time working in the governor's office, commissioner when you were last commissioner, um, 
uh, my career came to an end when I went to jail for four and a half months at the end of 2017 into 2018. I had, I'll be very brief about this, but I had suffered from lifelong mental illnesses, obsessive compulsive disorder and anxiety disorder. And I just dealt with it. Didn't tell my family or friends or anyone. That all changed in terms of dealing with it on September 11th, 2001, when the terrorist attacks occurred. I was fortunate to be working in Washington as John Baldacci's uh, press secretary. And my symptoms went out of control. Soon after that, I found that alcohol would help. And it did for a while and it didn't cause problems. And I didn't tell anyone about the alcohol use. And um, so my family and friends remained in the dark about the mental illnesses, about the self-medicating. And then they didn't find out about the first, second, third or fourth time I was arrested and charged with a crime. Somehow I managed to keep it all a secret until my final arrest in October of 2017, when I went to jail for four and a half months. Um, at that end of that time, I went into the uh, Penobscot County Drug Court program, and uh, my eyes were open to so many things, including the fact that there are so many people uh, with mental health issues, substance disorder issues, or co-occurring disorders who need our help. And um, I was very fortunate to have known Lee and worked with him in the governor's office many years ago. And he said, Doug, we have a great workforce development team. Could you be part of it and help us to do more outreach to those in recovery and reentry situations? So it was, uh, it's been the best job of my life, I would say so far. And working on this project um, has, has been a, a great way again to put my passion to work. So let me hey, jump Doug, in. Yes. Doug could you tell, tell, tell uh, the commissioner a little bit about the uh, phone call earlier this week with stakeholders that was really kind of the launch and in, in how that went? Absolutely. And, and, and the process of hiring peer counselors. A absolutely. That was Lee's way of telling me to move on. And, yes. uh, and well, so- it, at, it was a lot yeah. nicer until you said that, but- uh. we, we know each other very, very well. <laughs> so uh, yeah, uh, earlier this week, we had a great uh, information session like, through Zoom like this, and we had- Nearly 70 people participate. And that's really part of the effort to establish relationships, build partnerships, because that's what it's going to take. We need referrals uh, from other agencies and organizations. And then we're going to count on them to partner with us to help us to provide the services and the resources that people need. So um, we are in the process of hiring peer connectors, they're called. The program is called Maine's Connecting with Opportunities Initiative. It's a statewide effort. We're administrating, administering it. With ACAP, I see Aaron Benson here on the call, Aroostook County Action Program is partnering with us to implement the project in Aroostook County. We're covering Penobscot, Piscataquis, Hancock, and Washington counties. Um, and there are three parts to this. First, we're gonna do some direct hiring of these peer connectors. Secondly, we're, we're hoping to help at least 165 people during this two-year program. We're already trying to figure out how to make it sustainable beyond that. But we have a goal and hopefully we'll exceed the goal of at least 165 people. Uh, the third uh, part is because this is a dislocated worker grant from the USDOL, um, we're hoping to hire a number of people who are dislocated, whether they've been impacted or not by the opioid crisis into fields that will help to mitigate the crisis overall. So there are two, two tracks briefly. If you've been impacted by the opioid crisis, either directly or indirectly, perhaps someone in your family, um, uh, you should come to us and we want to help you. S on the second track, if you're a dislocated worker, whether you've been impacted or not, come see us. If you'd like to go into a field, recovery, uh, substance use disorder treatment, um, we'd, love to, we'd love to work with you. The, the critical thing, two last points, this project not only has resources and personal support um, uh, for education and training, and getting into employment, but it has plenty of resources for uh, supportive services. We know that people in recovery or any of us, if we start into a, a, a path, sometimes obstacles or hindrances come up along the way. Maybe a car breaks down, maybe someone needs child support help. Uh, we have resources to assist the people uh, in this new program. So uh, we want to, to help people with education, training, employment, but we also 
want to make sure that obstacles along the way are, are handled. We want to support people through that. And finally, I want to thank you, Commissioner, because the people on this call do not know that at critical moments during the application process for this grant, you quietly, but importantly, stepped in. You reached out to key people. Uh, so I want to thank you. Most people don't know what you did, but you helped to make this happen in important ways. So thanks to you and the governor's office and opioid response, um, uh, Gordon Smith there and others. Uh, this is a, a real important effort. And um, you can tell I could go on and on, but I will stop. Yes. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Doug. And Laura, before you ask a question, uh, we've got Richard Gordon here, who's the main drugs treatment court. And he's a good example on how we uh, interact with different folks. So um, thank you, Richard, thank for you. speaking. I, I know it's hard to get Doug to stop, but uh, you're just the guy to do it. <laughs> thank you, Lee. Uh, we're excited to be working with Doug on this project. Uh, we've got six adult drug treatment courts, three family recovery courts, two veterans treatment courts and a co-occurring disorders court that stretch from York to Washington County. And several of the teams have reached out to me already to get more information about this. I put Doug in touch with a couple of folks and Doug and Loretta came and uh, presented to the Hancock County drug court team this morning. And yeah, we're one of the hardest problems that the, the, the participants in the treatment courts face is finding employment. And so this is just a, an absolute boon to our programs, and, and we're very excited about this. Thank you for having me today. Yes. Well, and thanks for all the work you're doing. It's going to be part of the success. So really appreciate that. Uh, Commissioner, some questions for Doug on the, on the program? Yeah, I, I just want to say thank you to Doug and to you, Lee, for, um, for putting us in contact with Doug to actually write this grant. It was a, it was a long process getting it done. Um, but I think it's important um, mm -hmm. and we could not have done it without your efforts, Doug. Uh, so I am very excited to see that not only do we receive the grant, but that in spite of this pandemic, um, we're moving forward with it because I think that was one of the concerns is that can we, how do we keep that momentum going at a time when the world seems to have, um, have gotten uh, much harder to navigate and from what little uh, I know, it is particularly challenging for people who are experiencing substance use disorder um, because of you know, the isolation, the inability to go out into the workforce. Um, so I think this, this program is more important uh, than ever. And, um, and I'm looking forward to seeing uh, the progress that we make. And it's very encouraging to hear that we are already connected um, to the treatment courts um, because uh, we want to do that as quickly as possible. We want people um, to re-engage in meaningful ways with the community. That's what folks want. That's what their families want. That's what the communities want. So, so thank you for your leadership role here. Uh, it's deeply appreciated and it will make an enormous impact on our state. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I think you're the perfect commissioner for these times. Um, we're living in some real uncertain times. Uh, people are destroyed. People in recovery are. Everybody is. Businesses, communities. And so with that, I just want to, you know, part of the reason we wanted to do this is to create a forum of all the good things that Department of Labor sponsors and oversees and how it's being delivered by people on the ground. And that's why we, you know, my colleagues, uh, giving you this briefing today. So with that, what I'd like to end with is either a, a point or a quote or something about Frances Perkins, because she is your mentor. <laughs> she had faced great adversity, uh, not only uh, before she was the first woman cabinet member, Secretary of Labor, but previous to that, she was a real advocate for, for workers and children and people. So. I want to close this session with you coming up. Oh, she's looking for. I am. I'm trying to find like I've got the perfect quote. Oh, you know it by heart. Come on. No, no. I mean, you know, she has so many of them, but um, I think one of the things that uh, that she had said kind of recently, and I'm not going to be able to find it, Lee. Oh. You only have one minute. Don't worry. Uh, okay, but I, you know, I mean, basically. Um, 
what she had said uh, when she went to Washington was that she went to Washington to serve um, you know, FDR and the ordinary people uh, in the country. And I think during this incredibly challenging time, uh, that's, that's a guiding principle for me, and I know it is for everybody uh, in state government right now, is that um, the reason that we do this work is to serve the ordinary people and to make sure uh, that they receive the support, the, you know, the training, um, uh, and uh, whatever they need so that they are able to thrive. Um, but uh, thank you. Uh, so much, Lee. And Frances Perkins wasn't exactly a mentor. I, I, I didn't know her personally. I do know her grandson. Well, we're, we're living in a virtual world. Yeah. So she's a Virtually, virtual. I did know her then. Yes. But thank you so you much. You know her grandson. And I just want to, I mean, it's a true partnership uh, with Department of Labor. And I think your team, um, not only at the Career Center, but back in Augusta, have really been strong. And uh, we really appreciate it. So. Oh, wait a second. Can I get one more minute? Yes, please. Okay, I found the quote. <laughs> the one okay, I everybody take to... notes now. <laughs> okay, it's the process of recovery is not a simple one. We cannot be satisfied merely with makeshift arrangements which will tide us over past the present emergencies. We must devise plans that will not merely alleviate the ills of today, but will prevent it as far as is humanly possibly to do so, the reoccurrence in the future. And I think that's what we're trying to do here. Exactly. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, everybody. That was the perfect ending. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.